Hi everybody, welcome to another story time with Sid. It is me, Sydney of Hightower, as it is every week, and here we are again with another story. This time we are continuing with part two of this chapter of American folklore called Modern Folklore. Again, uh, I will preface that this is modern for 1961. So, let's see how this goes. This is called The Fabulous Wilson Meisner. Wilson Meisner was a fine raconteur, dude, skilled idler and jack of all larcenaries, larcenies, as Alva Johnston makes clear in this excerpt from his book devoted to the Meisner brothers. Wilson and the relatively respectable Addison, who often stooped to honesty. With all of his peccadillos, Wilson Meisner was an unparalleled wit. He not only gave the American language some of its sharpest sayings, but helped shape a whole school of sardonic humor. That is, he was a living source of folklore, and even before he died, a genuine legend. Whereas Mattis Addison Meisner may be ambitious, Wilson seemed to have none. Conversations was Wilson's hobby, profession, and neurosis. His fame as a wit and wit has grown steadily since his death at 57 in 1933. Although he wrote practically nothing, he's probably quoted more than any other American of this century. His chance remarks have been organized into a literature by his disciples. Like the character in Stendhal, who became a noted wit on the strength of six or seven pleasantries inherited from an uncle, scores of men have won recognition as sparkling conversationalists because they have made small private collections of Meisner sayings. Shortly before he died, a publisher asked him to write the story of his life. It would be blowing a police whistle, replied Meisner. This was a reasonable excuse. The crime chapters would have occupied a large part of his autobiography. He was fundamentally a confidence man whose circumstances occasionally induced to go straight. But his real reason for refusing to write an autobiography was he hated to write. He said, writing is too damned lonesome. He regarded it as an occupation for starvelings. Jim Tully once badgered him into writing a short story, which appeared in the Liberty in May 3rd of 1930. Meisner received a check of $1,000. He was incensed. It took me eight hours to write it, he exclaimed. The short story is rather poor, although it contains a few typical Meisner lines. After a description of the long, tapering fingers of a card sharp named Bert, Meisner added that Bert could do no more, no more with 52 soda crackers than any other ocean grafter could do with a new deck. The last paragraph of the story describes a tombstone erected over the grave of the hero, showing him kneeling with hands clasped in prayer, and the last line is, If you pried his hands open, four dice and a pearl necklace would fall out. Meisner was a little shamefaced over his literary effort. I wanted to see something of mine in print except my thumbs, he said. As a wit, Meisner belonged to two distinct schools, the scientific and the O. Henry. His scientific method consisted of bringing a calm spirit of inquiry to bear on boiling emotion. When an excited man rushed up to him exclaiming, Coolidge is dead, Meisner asked, How do they know? The O. Henry School was a school of fantastic exaggeration. During Meisner's formative years, smart conversation consisted ma mainly of tired hyperboles. A majority of the familiar quotations from Meisner are extravagant figures of speech. He described a thin man as a trellis of varicose veins. He told a conceited motion picture producer, a demi toss cup would fit over your head like a sunbonnet. Regarding a long-nosed Hollywood magnate, he said, he's the only man who can take a shower and smoke a cigar at the same time. And I'd like to take him by the feet and plow a furrow with him. Telling of a Klondike pal who had frozen to death in the act of tying his shoelaces, he said, we had to bury him in a drum. Talking about Tom Sharkey, the great heavyweight prize fighter who kept a saloon with the old-fashioned swinging doors, Meisner said, he was so dumb that he crawled under them for two years before he found out they swung both ways. He was asked by Lou Lipton, stage and screenwriter, if a certain actress wasn't a little mannish. Mannish, he said. Not at all. I understand it took her all winter to color a meerschaum pipe. Many of Meisner's lines have passed into the language. Some, like, life's a tough proposition and the first hundred years are the hardest, are passing out again after a long, hard service. His rules, 
No opium smoking in the elevators and carry out your own dead, which you put into effect as manager of the Hotel Rand in New York in 1907, have become standard hotel practice. Among his philosophical maxims were, be nice to people on your way up because you'll meet them on your way down. Treat a whore like a lady and a lady like a whore. And if you steal from one author, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many, it's research. H.L. Mencken, in his new dictionary of quotations attributed to Meisner, I respect faith, but doubt, it, doubt is what gets you an education. And a good listener is not only popular everywhere, but after a while, he gets to know something. Meisner's comment on Hollywood. It's a trip through a sewer in a glass-bottomed boat was converted by Mayor Jimmy Walker into a reformer is a guy who rides through a sewer in a glass-bottomed boat and has since become a shop-worn jewel of stump oratory. Two of Meisner's 30-year-old lines have recently had revivals in the movies. A magistrate asked him if he was trying to show contempt for court. No, I'm trying to conceal it, muttered Meisner. A friend argued that a certain Broadway producer must have a head to be successful. They put better heads on umbrellas, said Meisner. I may vomit, the smash line in The Man Who Came to Dinner, is a Meisnerism. The Meisner was, Meisner was seated in his regular table at the Brown Derby in Hollow, Hollywood when a young stranger introduced himself as a novelist and he had a big idea. The trouble with Hollywood, he said, was a lack of literary conversation. He asked Meisner to join him in founding a club that would meet an evening or two a week for literary conversation. Have I offended you? asked the author, noticing the expression on Meisner's face. Do you want me to leave? No. Well, you might move over a little, said Meisner, adding the statement that was so big on Broadway. Meisner was born in 1876. He was only the second most distinguished citizen of Venetia, the first being John C. Heenan and the, the Venetia Boy, heavyweight champion of America. A large-headed, spindle-shanked boy during his Benicia days, Wilson was described by Addison as wearing a number 7 collar and a number 8 hat. Even at this period, he had a genius for getting into trouble with school teachers and the village authorities, but he always emerged triumphant because of his glorified status of his family. When he was 13, his privileged place in the world was recognized by international law when his father was appointed minister to five Central American republics. The Law of Nations forbade the arrest of any member of the family for anything except murder. For the rest of his life, Meisner had a sort of subconscious belief that treaties had been entered into by the nations of the world, authorizing him to commit anything except capital crimes. For the rest of his life, the family returned to California after two years in Guatemala. Meisner's enjoyment of diplomatic immunity had given him too strong an I-do-as-I-please spirit for school discipline. After being expelled from softer institutions, he was sent to Santa Clara College, famous for changing young hellhounds into saints. Meisner caused a panic at Santa Clara by trying, to stay, by trying a stake to the rope of a fire gong after curfew, the alarm being sounded when the meat attracted attention of the large dogs that roamed the campus at night, encouraging students to stay in their dormitories. He was expelled for heating a cannonball for several hours, and then bowling it from a fire shovel along a corridor. He correctly forecast that the severest disciplinarian on the faculty would rush out and pick it up. Damon Runyon called Wilson Meisner the greatest man about town that anyone ever had, he was referring to the period when Meisner was a Broadway's leading wit and one of Broadway's successful playwrights and confidence men. But years before that, Meisner had been the greatest man about town in Dawson City and Nome. He was the world's foremost authority on the hot side of the frozen north. Nobody was ever snugger and cozier than he was at 60 below zero. The star writers of the Arctic School, Robert W. Service, Jack London, Rex Beach, and others, raved about the snowscapes, the glittering stars, and the aurora borealis. Meisner liked the crackling wood stoves, flickering candles, and smoking kerosene lamps. The literary artists painted the lonely immensities of the great outdoors. Meisner mixed with the gang and stuffy interiors. Flesh beat scenery, he said. The average Yukon literary artist found that the Arctic was God's country, and then ducked out as quick as he could. 
Meisner found the place overrun with crooks, con men, fugitives from justice, card sharps, adventuresses, and sporting ladies, then stayed there for six years. Like most men who make laughter in the main object in life, Meisner was somewhat given to exaggeration. But while he liked humorous exaggeration, he disapproved of solemn exaggeration. He had a lifelong contempt for Arctic fiction, with its supermen and super dogs, its abysmal brutes and exquisite ingenues. He was a stern debunker of the Arctic literary tradition. Jack London had taught the world that the Yukon had some of the magic that turned ribbon clerks and ladies tailors into ferocious primordial monsters. The truth is, said Meisner, that most of the fellows up there were the worst sissies on earth. I was in court when two hundred of them were robbed of their claims by a crooked judge and sent of thieving politicians. Did they spring up the judge and the 49ers would have done? Did they tear the politicians limb from limb? No, they just sat there crying in their beards, they slunk back into their cabins and had to be treated with smelling salts. While Meisner devoted much of his leisure to the denunciation of suckers and chumps, his routine evening in Hollywood consisted of coming to the Brown Derby, of which he was part owner with a thick roll of bills and giving them away at a few at a time to professional moochers. By midnight, he would, reduce, he would be reduced to getting his paper from the newsboy on credit. He offered the feeble resistance to some of the demands on his purse. Once, when a borrower asked for fifty dollars, he said, Here's twenty-five. Let's both make twenty-five. When a burglar came to him for a loan, he said, Doesn't it get dark anymore? In conversation, Meisner did his best to suppress the instincts of humanity. His later comic style was largely ridicule of all sentiment and feeling, although at times he could be soft in his behavior. He aimed at being as satanic and possible in speech. He and his brother Addison both maintained a pose of being completely divorced from human emotion. Anything shocking or saddening was made to order for their wit. Death was the finest of all comedy subjects because it provided the largest amount of emotion to be deflated. When Wilson and Addison were living together in Palm Beach, Addison came in one day with the news that another brother, Lansing, a San Francisco lawyer, had been killed in an automobile accident. Why didn't you tell me before I put on a red tie, said Wilson. Singularly enough, the best known and probably the greatest of Meisner's sayings is the only emotional line of his entire anthology and it bears on the subject of death. In 1910, when Meisner was stage managing Stanley Ketchell, the great middleweight who lasted 12 rounds with Jack Johnson, and who was the embodiment of the fighting spirit, news was telephoned to Meisner that Ketchell had been shot and killed. Tell him to start counting 10 over him and he'll get up, said Meisner. Meisner got all possible comedy value out of his own last illness. In March in 1933, in his 58th year, he had a heart attack in the Warner studio. Which he recovered con when he recovered consciousness, he was asked if he wanted a priest. I want a priest, a rabbi, and a Protestant clergyman, he said. I want to hedge my bets. His heart attack, President Roosevelt's inauguration, the bank holiday, and the California earthquake came at almost the same time. Meisner criticized this piling up of climaxes as bad melodrama. Told that his death was only a few hours away, Meisner rallied strength to send a postcard notifying a friend. They're going to bury me at 9 a.m., wrote Meisner. Don't be a sucker and get up. When they arranged a tent over him for the administration of oxygen, he said, it looks like the main event. Coming out of a coma, coma shortly before his death, he waved a priest away disdainfully. Why should I talk to you, he said. I've just been talking to your boss. And that was... The Fabulous Wilson Meisner. I've never heard of him before in my entire life. It's interesting what necessarily makes you a notable human being. I think it varies from place to place, from culture to cult culture, from time period to time period. But it seems in this time period, what made him so famous was just the fact that he was so quotable. And he did so many things and affected so many people. I have to say, though, some of, some of his quotes were actually pretty good. Um, I didn't understand some of them, but I've definitely heard, be nice to people on your way up because you'll meet them on your way down before. And I think some of them make a lot of sense. So it's really interesting how one human being 
can influence so many just because of their mind. It's fascinating. Next, we have the Telltale Seaweed. This is the story just as I heard it the other evening, said Alexander Wolcott as he introduced this modern ghost story to his large magazine and radio audience. He went on to say that he had tried to trace it down from novelist Alice Dior Miller, who told it to him, to the friend who had told it to her, and so on. He never succeeded, as is usually the case with traveling stories. It seems that one chilly October night in the first decade of the present century, two sisters were motoring along a Cape Cod road when their car broke down just before midnight and would go no further. This was an era when such mishaps were both commoner and more hopeless than they are today. For these two, there was no chance of help until another car might chance to come by in the morning and give them a tow. Of a lodging for the night, there was no hope except a gaunt, unlighted frame house which stood black in the moonlight across a neglected stretch of frost-hardened lawn. They yanked at its ancient bell pole, only a faint tinkle within made answer. They banged disparagingly on the door panel, only to waken what at first they thought was an echo, and then identified as a shutter responding antiphonally with the help of a nipping wind. This shutter was around the corner, and the ground floor window behind it was broken and unfastened. There was enough moonlight to show that the room within was a deserted library, with a few books left on the sagging shelves and a few pieces of dilapidated furniture still standing where some departing family had left them long before. At least a sweep of the electric flash which one of the women had brought with her showed that on an uncarpeted floor the dust lay thick and trackless as if no one had trod there in many a day. They decided to bring their blankets in from the car and stretch out there on the floor until daylight. None too uncomfortable, perhaps, but at least sheltered from the salt and cutting wind. It was a while they were lying there, trying to get to sleep, while, indeed, they had drifted halfway across the borderland that they saw, each confirming the other's fear by a convulsive grip of the hand, saw standing by the empty fireplace, as if trying to dry himself by a fire that was not there, the wraith-like figure of a sailor come dripping from the sea. After an endless moment in which either sister breathed, one of them somehow found the strength to call out, Who's there? The challenge shattered the intolerable silence and the sound muttering a little. They said afterwards it was something between a groan and a whimper. The misty figure case seemed to dissolve. They strained their eyes but could see nothing between themselves and the battered mantelpiece, then telling themselves, and as one does half believing it, that they had been dreaming. They tried again to sleep, and indeed did sleep, until a patch of shuttered sunlight striped the morning floor. As they sat up and blinked, the gritty realism of the forsaken room they would, I think, have laughed at their shared illusion of the night before, had it not been for something which one of the sisters pointed out with a kind of gasp. There, in the still undisturbed dust on the spot in front of the fireplace, where the apparition had seemed to stand, was a patch of water a little circular pool that had issued from no crack in the floor, nor, as far as they could see, fallen from any place in the innocent ceiling. Near it, in the surrounding dust, was no footprint, their own or any others, and in it was a piece of green that looked like seaweed. One of the women bent down and put her finger into the water, then lifted it to her tongue. The water was salty. After that, the sisters scuttled out and sat in the car until a passerby gave them a tow to the nearest village. In the tavern at breakfast, they gossiped with their proprietress about the empty house down the road. Oh yes, it had been just that way for a score of years or more. Folks did say the place was spooky, haunted by a son of the family who, driven out by his father, had shipped before the mast and had been drowned at sea. Some said the family had moved away because they could not stand the sight of the things that they saw in the night. A year later, one of the sisters told the story at a dinner party in New York. In the pause that followed, a man across the table leaned forward. My dear lady, he said, I happen to be a curator of a museum where they are doing a good deal of work on submarine vegetation. In your place, I never would have left that house without taking a bit of seaweed with me. Of course you wouldn't, she entered tartly, and neither did I. It seems she lifted it out of the water and dried it a little by pressing it against the window pane. Then she carried it off in her pocket at book as a souvenir. 
As far as she knew it, it was still in an envelope in a little drawer of her desk at home. If she could find it, would he like to see it? He would. Next morning, she sent it around by messenger, and a few days later, it came back with a note. You were right, the note said. It is the seaweed. Furthermore, it may interest you to learn that it is of a rare variety, which, as far as we know, grows only on dead bodies. And that was the telltale seaweed. Oh, oh, I love that. Oh, I love that so much. We haven't really had a really, well, I guess we've had a few ghost stories, but that one was a very traditional um, New England style ghost story that are very, very popular, I know, in America. And it was fascinating to read. I don't know if things like spirits exist in a more traditional sense like this, but I like to think that, are, that there are some things in the mortal realm and in the fey realm that we can't really explain. There are so many things and so many experiences that people have had. So many realities that have been seen with the eyes, illusions or not, that we can't explain. So until we understand more about how human beings' brains function, or how the world around us functions, there's a lot of mystery still to be discovered. Next, we have John McGraw's Jinx Killer. Toward the end of his great career as a pitcher for the New York Giants, Christy Mainsworth wrote a book of reminiscence and observation about big league baseball. Pit pitching in a pinch. One of his many subjects was jinxes, and what they mean to ball players, perennially a superstitious lot. Here he tells how giant manager John McGraw, who's canny ma managing, like Matthewson's pitching arm, has become a baseball legend, once went to the extreme of hiring a man just to kill jinxes. What manager could have carried a Kansas farmer around the circuit with him besides John McGraw? I refer to Charles Victor Faust of Marion, Kansas, the most famous jinx killer of them all. Faust first met the Giants in St. Louis on the next to last trip the club made west in the season of 1911. When he wandered into the Planters Hotel one day, asked for McGraw and announced that a fortune teller had informed him he would be a great pitcher and that for five dollars he could have a full reading. This pitching announcement piqued Charles and he reached down into his jeans, dug out his last five, and passed it over. The fortune teller informed Faust that all he had to do to get into the headlines of the newspapers and to be a great pitcher was to join the New York, New York Giants. He joined, and after he once joined, it would have taken the McNa McNamara's in their best form to separate him from the said Giants. Charlie came out to the ballpark and amused himself warming up. Incidentally, the Giants did not lose a game while he was there in their neighborhood. The night the club left for Chicago on that trip, he was down at the Union Station, ready to go along. Did you get your contract and transportation, asked McGraw, as a lanky Kansan appeared. No, answered Charlie. Psh, replied McGraw. I left it for you in the, with the clerk in the hotel. The train leaves in two minutes, he continued, glancing at his watch. If you can run the way you say you can, you can make it back in time to catch it. It was the last we saw of Charlie Faust for a time galloping on the platform in his angular way with a contract of transportation in sight. I'm almost sorry we left him, remarked R McGraw, as Charlie disappeared into the crowd. We played on around the circuit with indifferent good luck and got back to New York with the penance no more than a possibility, and rather remote one at that. The first day we were in New York, Charlie Faust entered the clubhouse with several inches of dust and mud kicked on him, for he'd come all the way either by a side door or a blind baggage. I'm here all right, he announced quietly, and started to climb into a uniform. I see you are, answered McGraw. Charlie stuck around for two or three days, and we won. Then McGraw decided he would have to be dropped and, and in, then McGraw decided he would have to be dropped and ordered the man on the door of the clubhouse to bar this Kansas kid out. Faust broke down and cried that day, and we lost. After that, he became a member of the club and we won game after game until some busy newspaper man obtained a vaudeville engagement for him at a salary of $100 a week. We lost three games the week he was absent from the grounds, and Faust saw at once he was not doing the right thing by the club, so with a wave of his hand that would have gone with J.P. Morgan's income, he passed up some lucrative vaudeville contracts, much to the disgust of the newspaper man, who was cutting the rumination with him, 
and settled down to business. The club did not lose a game after that, and it was decided to fake to take Faust West with us on the last famous trip in 1911. Daily, he had been bothering McGraw and Mr. Brush for his contract, for he wanted to pitch. The club paid him some money from time to time to meet his personal expenses. The Sunday night the club left for Boston, a vaudeville agent was at the Grand Central Station with a contract offering Faust $100 a week for five weeks, which Charlie refused in order to stick with the club. It was the greatest trip away from home in the history of baseball. Starting with the pennant almost out of reach, the Giants won 18 and lost four games. One contest that we dropped in St. Louis was when some of the newspaper correspondents on the trip kidnapped Faust and sat him on the St. Louis bench. Another day in St. Louis, the game had gone 11 innings, and the Cardinals needed one run to win. They had several incipient scores on the bases, and Rube McCard, in the box, was apparently going up in the air. Only one was out. Faust was warming up far in the suburbs when, under orders from McGraw, I ran out and sent him to the bench, for that was the place from which his charm seemed to be most potent. Charlie came loping from the bench as fast as his long legs would transport him, and St. Louis didn't score, and we won the game. It was a nice piece of pinch mascotting, as I ever saw. The first two games that Charlie really lost were in Chicago, and all through the trip he re reiterated his weird prophecies that the Giants with manager McGraw were going to win. The players believed in him, and none would have let go of it if it had been necessary to support him out of their own pockets. And we did win. Charlie, with his monologue and great good humor, kept the players in high spirits throughout their journey and the feeling prevailed that we wouldn't lose with him along. He was advertised all over the circuit, and spectators were going to the ballpark to see Faust and Wagner. Charlie admitted that he would fan out, fan out Wagner because he had learned how to pitch out there in Kansas by correspondence school and had read of his weakness in a book. Charlie's one groove was ma massages and manicures. He would go out to the barber shop with any member of the team who happened to be getting shaved and take a massage and a manicure for the purposes of sociability, as a man takes a drink. He easily was the record holder for the mar manicure marathon, hanging up the figures of five in one day in St. Louis. He also liked pie for breakfast, dinner and supper, and a small amount before retiring. But alas, Charlie lost in the World Series. He couldn't make good and a jinx killer never comes back. He's gone, and his expansive smile, the bump to bump slide are gone with him. That is, McGraw hopes he's gone, but he was a wonder while he had it, and he did a great deal toward giving the players confidence. With him on the bench, they thought they couldn't lose, and they couldn't. It has long been superstition among ball players that when a bug joins the club, it will win a championship, and the Giants believed that when Charlie Faust arrived, did Charlie Faust win the championship for the Giants? And that was John McGraw's Jinx Killer. Interesting. Um, the most American thing in the world is probably baseball. It's the one thing that America really created when they were becoming what we think of today as America. So it's interesting actually hearing a story about baseball because we haven't yet, and it, human beings are naturally superstitious, cautious, anxious. Their brains are constantly at war with themselves between their instincts and their rational fears and what they typically know to be true about the world. So it's a really interesting dichotomy, being a human and being so superstitious. Hmm. The Girl in the Lavender Dress Every year, the girl in the long lavender dress is sighted somewhere in the United States, a quick flicker of color on a nocturnal country road. She is one of the most enduring and romantic figures in modern American folklore. This is poet and folklore collector Carl Carmer's version of her story. A few years ago, the postmaster in a village that lies beside the lonely waters of the Ramapo River, dappled by light and leaf, shadow in the morning, and darkened by hill shadows in the afternoon, talked often about a lithe, tawny girl with hyacinth eyes and wheat-yellow hair. He was a sophisticated gentleman, traveled in Urbane, a member of a distinguished family in those parts. 
To atone for his sins, he said, he taught a boys' class in a Sunday school that was in session on the first day of each week after the preaching in a tiny, weathered church in the Ramapo Hills. From the summits of those hills, on a clear day washed by recent rain, the slim gray towers on Manhattan Island seemed to advance into sight and hang, like figures long ago worked into the tapestry on the old blue sky wall. None of the boys in the Sunday school had ever entered the city on the horizon, and only a few of them had been to Hilburn or Slotesburg in New York State, or any of the New Jersey towns to the west. They were a shy lot, but wild as woods animals are wild, and they found simple lessons in Christian ethics. The postmaster was trying to teach difficult at best, and impossible at the times when that girl was around. She went through his class, and the postmaster said, like a slow pestilence, a boy would be gone for a month, sometimes two months, and then he would come back on a Sunday glowering and sheepish, and one of his schoolmates would be absent for a while. The Sunday school teacher would sometimes see him and the girl picking wild blackberries on a hillside, or on a Saturday night walking the road, shoes in hand, to a country dance. There was much talk about the girl among the hill folk gossips, and the postmaster, whose job gave him speaking acquaintance with most of these, gathered from what they said that she was a gay and hot-tempered and immoral, feeling that the general admiration gave her the privilege of disobeying the somewhat eccentric conversations of her own community. The only time she had a good look at her was a Wednesday night prayer at which, according to an announcement the previous Sunday, the contents of three barrels of old clothes from the members of a New York City church would be distributed. The girl came in after the service, and just as the preacher beat in the head for the first barrel, she was barefoot, and it was obvious that she wore only a stained patched calico-checked dress much too small for her. She sat in the back pew and paid no attention to as the usual pathetic garments that are contained in such shipments were displayed and granted to those who could argue the greatest need. There was a gasp when the preacher pulled from the middle section of the barrel a lavender evening dress covered with sequins that glinted like tiny amethysts. It was, a low, it was cut low off the shoulders, and as soon as the preacher saw that, he rolled it up into a shapeless bundle, holding it helpless and waiting for someone to speak for it. No one did. But the girl stood up and padded swiftly down the aisle. Without saying a word, she grabbed the dress from the good man's hands and raced out of the church. From that time on, the postmaster said no one ever saw the girl in any other costume. Rain or shine, day or night, she was a brush stroke of lavender against the brown of dirt roads, the green of hill slopes, the khaki-colored shirts and pants of whatever boy strode beside her. Frost came early that year and leaves dropped. The air was clear and the New York towers came nearer and stayed longer. The hill people were all talking about a letter that had come to the girl from cousins in Jersey City. The postmaster had told one of his Sunday school boys that the letter had come the next day. She had stood before his window and quietly asked for it, the sequins glinting purple in the shadowy room. People who dropped in the next day said her cousins had invited her to visit them and they had sent money for her, to her for bus fare. A week later, a witness regaled the postmaster with a description of the expressions on the faces of the bus passengers down the asphalt highway 12 miles away when the girl climbed aboard holding her long skirt about her waist. In mid-December came a cold snap and the thermometer outside showed 18 degrees below zero when the postmaster opened his window for business. The people in line of waiters for mail were more eager to give him the news than to receive their letters. The body of the girl in the lavender dress had been found frozen and stiff on the road a few miles above the bus stop. Returning from Jersey City, she had left the bus and begun the long walk home, but the evening dress proved too flimsy to wear for such a night. The postmaster said that after this tragedy, all the students in his class came regularly to Sunday school, and that was the end of the story of the girl. The girl froze to death about 1939, and for a decade, nothing reflected doubt on the postmaster's conclusion. But now, a growing number of people feel that this narrative, the truth of which is easily provable by many witnesses, has had an inexplicable consequence, overtones that transcend this matter-of-fact realism. For a strange report recently began its rounds of upstate towns, and particularly colleges. It had many variants, as such tales do, but, none, but in none of them was in any way connected with the account of the girl, her dress, and her death, a factual record known only in the vicinity of her Ramapo home and the suggestion of such a connection is made here, possibly for the first time. As I heard it, 
two Hamilton College juniors motoring to a dance at Tuxedo Park after sunset of a warm Indian summer Saturday on the road that runs through the valley of Little Ramapo River saw a girl waiting. She was wearing a party dress in the color of mist rising above the dark water of the stream and her hair was the color of ripe wheat. The boys stopped the car and asked the girl if they could take her to the direction she was going. She eagerly seated herself between them and asked if they were going to the square dance at Stealing Furnace. The thin, tanned face with high cheekbones and yellow hair, that flashing smile and the quicksilver quality of her gestures enchanted the boys, and it was soon a matter of amused debate whether they would go along with her to the Stealing Furnace, which she would accompany them to the dance at Tuxedo. The, ma the majority won, and the boys were soon presenting their new friend to the young couple, who were their hosts at the park. Call me Lavender, she said to them. It's my nickname because I always wear that color. After an evening in which the girl, quiet and smiling, made a most favorable impression by her dancing, drifting dreamily along the waltzes in a sparkling cloud of lavender sequins, stepping more adeptly than any other dancers through the complications of revived square dances, Money Musk, Hull's Victory, Nellie Gray, the boys took her out to their car for the ride home. She said that she was cold and one of them doffed his tw tweeted top coat and helped her into it. They were both shocked into cliches of courtesy when, after gaily directing the driver through the dusty woodland roads, she finally bade him stop before a shack so dilapidated that it would have seemed deserted had it not been for the ragged lace curtain over the small window in the door. After promising to see them again soon, she waved goodnight and standing beside the road and, until they had turned around and rolled away. They were almost in tuxedo before the chill air made the coatless one realize he'd forgotten to reclaim his property, and they decided to return for it on their way back to college the next day. The afternoon was clear and sunny when, after considerable difficulty in finding the shack, the boys knocked on the door with a ragged lace curtain over the window. A decrepit white-haired woman answered the door and peered at them with piercing blue eyes when they asked for lavender. "'Old friends of hers?' she asked and the boys, boys, fearing to get the girl into bad graces of her family by telling them the truth about their adventures of the day before, they said yes. They were old friends. Then you couldn't have heard? She's dead, said the woman. Been in the graveyard down the road for near ten years. Horrified, the boys protested this was not the girl they meant, that they were trying to find someone that they had seen the previous evening. Nobody else of that name ever lived around here, said the woman. Twent her real name anyway. Her pa named her Lily when she was born. Some folks used to call her Lavender on the account of the pretty dress she wore all the time. She was buried in it. The boys once more turned about and started for the paved highway. A hundred yards back down the road, a driver jammed on the brakes. There's a graveyard, he said, pointing to a few weathered stones standing in bright sunlight in an open field overgrown with weeds. And just for the hell of it, I'm going over there. They found the stone, a little one marked Lily and on the curving mound in front of it, neatly folded, was a tweed peacoat. And that was the girl in the lavender dress. Now before I continue any further, there is this lovely illustration that I'd like to show you. I feel like I have heard this ghost story before. Um, I think I definitely have, uh, just in a different form, because I have heard of someone meeting a ghost, having a wonderful time, them giving her their coat, and then finding it on her grave the next morning. I feel like that was in a book I read when I was very young, but nevertheless, it's still a very interesting and chilling tale. I was, this time, in this adaptation of the story, there is more context to what the girl was like before she interacted with the, the boys. Outliers of society have always existed. They're just as common as anybody else. It's sad to think that she was so cold, that that's the way she ended her life, but while she was alive, I'm glad that she lived it the way that she wanted to. Because just because not everyone necessarily sees that your actions have value or, or they seem like they're out of place, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong or bad, they're, you're just different. Being different's okay. And wear that lavender dress with the sequins. 
because no one else will. Anyway, this has been the second, um, second chapter. This has been the second section of this chapter of American folklore, modern folklore, as you can see how modern it is, and I hope you'll join me again next week. If this is your first time, welcome. If it's not, welcome back, and I hope to see you again. I hope you're all staying happy, healthy, and safe. Thank you so much. Bye!